Okay, I think this is the last uh, folks coming in. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is the... <coughs> Let me read out the official title. Uh, this is... Uh, the ba, 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 ba. Okay, sorry, yeah, XR enablement, excuse me, sorry, first time, first time uh, jitters. My name is Carl, I'm from Osram AMS. We do uh, laser sensors, all that sort of stuff. Today I'm facilitating uh, for a really exciting presentation today. Uh, these guys are going to give you a, a walkthrough of how they're really going to industrialize some of the metamaterials that are needed for XOR enablement for the masses. As we all know, there is a market penetration of the 0.0%. We need it into the 20s and 30%. So some of the material science that these guys are doing today will really enable that and help us all for tomorrow. So before I let these guys start, I've got some uh, little housekeeping things. First is uh, coffee, because of time zones and people jet lag, etc. There's a uh, free coffee, thanks to Niantic. It's up uh, till 11.30, up on the other floor. Happy hour this afternoon, if the jet lag uh, prevails. Uh, this is uh, over in the playground, right after that uh, happy hour. We're moving into the Augie Awards, you know, the interesting uh, night. I think there's 35 different categories this evening, so pretty much something for everyone. And after that, there's a, um, if you go to the glass house in San Jose, I believe there's buses leaving from here. There's a, an after party also. So a lot of this wouldn't really happen unless we had some sponsors. And one of those sponsors uh, happens to be uh, Metamaterials. So big thanks, big shout out to them. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Andrew, who's going to give you a, a review of what these guys are doing. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It's, re it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, we've seen a lot of exciting developments, both from big companies and small companies, lots of entrepreneurship. Um, I have to say, suffered a, the dark side of entrepreneurship this morning, so our car was broken into. I think someone saw that as a new business opportunity. So apologies if this is not quite as polished as it should be. Um, so Raghab and I are here to speak to you about um, a variety of technologies that we've developed and, and processes that we're putting in place at Meta. Uh, to re-serve the augmented reality market. Uh, so a little bit about Meta, the company itself. So we're, um, we're a growing company. We, we have a broad patent portfolio uh, that we are continuing to add to. Um, I'll discuss a minute, in a minute a variety of different verticals that we're playing within, uh, but we'll focus today on the augmented reality and optical side of things. Um, we have a lot of uh, in-house tools that we've built in the way of simulation software. Um, we do a lot of proprietary design, we do a lot of development work, we're always with the intention of building to volume. Um, one of the things that's really built into the ethos is that we, we want our processes to be scalable because we want to be able to serve a market that's, that's vast and large, um, but we also want them to be sustainable. Uh, we have an environmental, um, we're environmentally aware, let's say, and we're always conscious of and looking for ways to ensure that uh, our technologies and our processes are, are doing the best for the planet. Um, and we're quite proud of the fact that just recently we have uplisted to NASDAQ and we represent the first company that is, has a med material focus that has been listed publicly on the NASDAQ market. So we do, we do have a global footprint uh, across the world. So uh, we have an office here in Pleasanton, California. That's where Ragup works out of. Um, I myself, I'm based in, in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, on the east side of Canada. Uh, that's the headquarters of the company. We have other locations. Uh, in London, mainly focused on medical device applications. Uh, and we've recently acquired a company called Nanotech Security, and they have locations uh, for R&D in Burnaby, BC, that's essentially Vancouver, uh, and then also for manufacturing and production in Thurso, Quebec. And we also have uh, locations for R&D in, in Switzerland, uh, and then sales on offices and distribution centers in, in Denmark and in Japan. So we'd like to divide the various different technologies and product lines that we've got into a couple of different categories. The first is we, we do a lot of work on protection. Uh, so one of the, the first applications that we worked on was laser protection, particularly aimed at the aviation industry. Uh, there's an ongoing problem there with laser attacks on aircraft. Uh, and our technology is designed to protect pilots and protect pilots' vision uh, against those sorts of attacks. Uh, we also do a lot of work on, on nanolithography. Ragup will speak to that in more detail. Uh, and there's a variety of product lines there that are focused on uh, various different ways of connecting, um, both through uh, RF um, and, and other technologies to, uh, to allow 
um, higher connectivity between various different uh, devices. Um, and then we also have a very strong program for detection. Uh, I, I spoke already about the medical device applications that are being worked on in the London office. Uh, and those are focused mainly on things like non-invasive sensing of glucose, um, and also things like mammography or, or other um, non-ionizing forms of imaging. But today, what we'll focus on is combiner optics. Um, so we, we, I already mentioned, have a long history of working on laser protection devices uh, using volume holographic gratings. Um, we, we have recently started producing a line of, of optics that are intended for um, lab applications, so optical lab applications. We call these uh, strata and slant. You can see on the left here, uh, what essentially is a conventional uh, or behave something very similar to what a conventional dielectric filter would, would uh, except that it's based on polymer technologies. Uh, and then in the center, you've got something that's a little bit more interesting. You can see a, a white laser beam is striking, or an RGB laser beam, I should say, is, is striking uh, the holographic filter. Um, and the green beam is being selected and picked off and redirected into an anomalous angle. Um, but what we're, we're most interested in for this particular venue is holographic optical elements. So these are elements that have uh, very highly selective uh, reflection characteristics and, and both reflect and um, and focus into particular points. Um, so why are they interesting for this application? Because they're useful as combiners. Um, and what do you look for in a holograph or in a combiner for any sort of augmented reality application? Uh, you're looking for something that has high transparency so that you can see the real world while at the same time being selectively reflective so that you can see the light that's coming from the digital protector. And that allows you to overlay digital information with the real world. Um, and that combiner, whatever technology you use for that, is, is the key element that allows you to, to do that merging of the digital world with the real world. Um, now, to have something that's useful, you have this sort of laundry list on the right-hand side here of different characteristics that are required of that. And a lot of them are contradictory. Um, so you do need to have things like high optical efficiency, but at the same time, you want to have high see-through quality. Um, so there's very much a trade-off analysis that has to be done to ensure that you get the best of both worlds. Um, one of the ones that we, or a couple of the characteristics that we really are focused on, and, and this is mainly driven by the fact that we're, we're looking to, to enter into partnerships and develop products that are, uh, are, are, will scale to very large volumes. So that means essentially consumer wearables, all-day wearables. And the characteristics that you require for those sorts of applications are, are things like acceptable social or acceptable form factors that are, are, are socially comfortable, um, and things that are lightweight, uh, and, and also a product that has prescription compatibility. And that's something that I'll come back to in a minute. And so our, our main interest here is, is not the projector, it's not the computing, it's the combiner. It's that optical element. And our approach to that is something that we're calling the one-stop shop. Um, so what we offer is for that combiner element, we're offering design expertise, so people can come to us and, and ask essentially what is possible in the way of, uh, of the various different technologies and what are the various trade-offs. Um, the main technology that we use to produce these combiners is, is volume holographic gratings recorded in a photopolymer material. Um, we have a very close relationship with Corvestro, who is the leading supplier of holographic photopolymer material. Uh, we, do, we have an ongoing and, and very fruitful uh, material selection and material development agreement with them. Um, we have the expertise necessary to do the holographic recording itself and to take that hologram and then combine it or assemble it into a stack that can then be integrated into lens. And one of the most important things that we've got is this, this technology that we call AR Fusion that I'll get into in a little bit more detail that, that allows us to embed the holographic optic element, which is really the functional part, into a lens that can then be embedded into consumer electronics. Uh, and all of this is, is developed using approaches that are scalable to volume manufacturing. Um, so, just a couple of words on free space optical combiners. Um, so, we're, we're uh, quite fond of these. Um, we think they have a lot of potential because of those social implications uh, and because of the prescription factors that I mentioned earlier. So, they offer very high brightness. Um, that means that that translates directly into efficiency. So, you're not wasting a lot of light. That means that the, the light source can be dimmer. That means that the battery life can be longer, or conversely, the battery can be much smaller. And that contributes to a device that's much more compact and therefore much more um, uh, appealing to consumers. 
Uh, we, free space combiners also offer high fields of view, uh, very good see-through quality, of course. And, and then this is an important one that I'll come back to in, for a little bit more detail, but they offer not just prescription compatibility, but prescription compatibility in what's called best form. And I'll describe that in a little bit more detail. Um, and multiple optical functions can be multiplexed into a single piece of film. Okay, that's one really nice thing about volume holographic ratings is that there are limits to this, of course, but you can put multiple functions into one piece of, or one hologram. Um, the other technology that we think is really important is what we're calling AR fusion, and this is the ability to build essentially plastic lenses. Um, but they're plastic lenses into which we can embed the holographic optic element, that key functional uh, component. So what you see on the left-hand side is, is the filling process. So it's, it's a casting process. It's, it happens at, uh, at atmospheric pressure, at low temperatures. Uh, and, and that means that it's suitable for embedding all sorts of relatively sensitive uh, devices. So here, what we're focused on is holographic optical elements. Um, but Ragip will describe in more detail other uh, potential components that can be added to the mix. Um, again, what's important about it is, is that um, these lenses that are produced downstream can be processed using all, all the normal ophthalmic tools that already exist within the industry. There's a huge and very mature industry that, that is out there for, for taking pieces of plastic, essentially, and turning them to eyewear lenses that everyone wears. Um, and so this sort of technology meshes very nicely with that. So uh, one of the things that we're, we like to emphasize is that 70% of the population wears glasses. Okay? They need prescription eyewear. Um, and it's, it's one thing to produce a lens that has the right spherical power, as you can see on the right here. So there are different combinations that you can use to produce a given spherical power, but there's, there's one combination known as the best form that is the right one to use, so to speak. So this curve down here, which has been known for 100, 150 years or so, is known as the turning ellipse. And, and this determines for a given prescriptive power what sort of base curve or what sort of curvature you should be using. And the consequences of not doing that is that you get poor peripheral vision. Now, the nice thing about free space combiners for AR is that it allows you to use best form shapes, base curves, to satisfy the prescription that the patient requires. And that's, that's really important for ensuring that you've got, again, the good peripheral vision, but it's also really important for, we believe, acceptance by the medical community. I mean, we're talking about patients and prescriptions here. These are medical devices, class one medical devices. And so, again, one of the big reasons that we think that AR fusion combined with free space optical combiners is so important is that it allows us to produce best form lenses that adhere to all the best principles that have been established by the ophthalmic industry over the last hundred years. Now, we do have an interest and activity in developing waveguides. Uh, so this is an example of uh, using the same approach, cold casting uh, in AR fusion to produce very uh, planar, uh, very smooth, um, and very high optical quality plastic waveguides. Okay, so here are some of the characteristics that you can, you can see are very much comparable to what you would expect for glass. And um, in this case, we have um, some variability and we're working on different indices of refract refraction. Um, but the idea is that they're well matched to the covestro photopolymer material that we know so well. So the idea is that this can be a very uh, a powerful solution, uh, again, by taking advantage of the multiplexing that's possible with volume holographic ratings produce, to produce an all polymer solution to the waveguide problem. Um, and that can potentially be very, very lightweight, but also um, splinter free. That's, that's an important safety consideration and very, very cost effective. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ragip. And he'll guide you through some of the other technologies that we're working on and, and other things that can be integrated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, in this, I guess uh, there's a little bit of a short amount of time. And this uh, time, I, I will try to um, discuss the um, ways we can basically combine electrical and optical functionalities on a small form factor. This is a major challenge for future AR. AR applications, and the challenge is being driven by the wavelength of light, which basically creates a large mismatch between the electrical and optical components. And one way to circumvent that is basically making non-structured materials, which can enable us to 
combined these uh, features in sub-waving uh, length scales. And we have seen beautiful examples in the past two decades of such structures actually uh, replicating the dialectic optical functionalities in sub-wavelength uh, ultra-thin film platforms, such as uh, we can make uh, actually um, uh, diffraction, focusing, uh, we can have polarization control as well as light field control. However, until recently, such structures were not be able to be made by using low-cost manufacturing techniques at production scale. And Meta wants to basically aims to fill in this gap with its expertise in the design as well as the manufacturing tools at scale. So up to now, uh, we have discussed our holographic approach where basically we create free space and waveguide combiners using our direct right uh, manufacturing schemes. And in this part, I will describe our manufacturing tools, how to add additional functionalities to the next generation AR components. We have at Meta two distinct lithography approaches. One is UV NIR, uh, or non imprint lithography, which enables us to make um, grayscale um, printing. So we can basically combine, as you can see in this, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I guess, all right. So as you can see in this uh, atomic force microscope image, uh, we can basically combine non-structured materials with micron scale features. This is a unique advantage that allows us to control the color levels as well as the depth. And as a different approach, we have rolling mass lithography, which enables us to print dielectric as well as metallic non-structures at from 200 uh, nanometers to one micron features. And these two different techniques complement each other, uh, where basically in, in terms of the material selection as well as the printing scales, we can use it for a variety of applications, which enables us to address several applications from brands secure production to transparent antennas and other electrical functionalities that I will describe in a moment. Just to briefly go over, I, I guess uh, due to the time constant, I will skip on the details of this process. But in the rolling mass lithography, the critical message here is we have basically a combination of phase shift lithography, which is combines the advantages of the soft lithography and roll through roll techniques. And in kind of compared to a standard lithography process where you use a standard mask and you are limited to five micron for a roll through roll processing, we use a transparent mask which actually uses non-structured features in the mask itself, which enables and creates an interference pattern right in the photoresist with sub-wavelength resolution. So using the same materials, low-cost materials and process steps, we can create basically 10 times smaller features in a roll through roll fashion. And in the next, um, well, one of the unique, I would say, um, ingredients that we have both for the uh, rolling mass lithography as well as the non imprint lithography is the in-house design capability for optimizing the structures. For every application, we need to tune the parameters by using our analytical models as well as uh, in-house softwares and basically apply these into a master. With a recent acquisition of the Nanotech security, we have now in-house e-beam lithography capability where we make our own masters. And using propriety um, uh, replication process, we can re recombine these masks into a large area mask. And we can basically um, feed this into a 1.2 meter web uh, in the NIL, which can speed up to 150 meters per minute uh, in the printing, which is finally uh, fed into the deposition process. Uh, in the product line, we have color optic, which I just uh, described. We can combine the non-structured features with uh, micro-scale features. And this enables us actually to control the motion depth and the color of these features without any use of inks or dye. Here, what you see is actually these colorful pictures, uh, which are created by just tuning the non-structured properties, such as the diameter, the pitch, and the height, we can basically adjust the color, the spectrum of the absorption, and create these colorful uh, pictures. Because of these are non-structured, we can print this really at ultra-high resolution, which is almost impossible to create uh, using a low-cost uh, production. Another feature that we have here is, as I, uh, as I described earlier, using non uh, rolling mass lithography, we can create uh, metallic as well as dielectric non-structures. The distinction here from non-imprint is that we use a lift-off process, meaning we can basically use any type of materials, 
high dielectrics or metals. Another distinctive property is we do not have any residual layer in between the, uh, the features here. So this is complete substrate, which means we can make them completely transparent. Now, by just adjusting the tuning parameters of the, these uh, gradings, we can basically make highly conductive and transparent materials, which we branded as nanoweb in this case. Here in this chart, I compare the transparency versus sheet resistance for a variety of different uh, competitive technologies. So in addition to the advantages such as being bendable and uh, you know, compatible with the flexible substrates, we can have exceedingly superior conductivity versus transparency. As you can see, it's a single digit at almost 99% transparency. So having such high conductivity enables us to define several different functionalities, electrical as well as optical, that we can basically uh, seamlessly apply onto windows and lensing systems. Thanks to the lithography process, we can basically pattern this non-web or other type of non-structures directly and create features such as this optical functionality of 5G signal, which can be redirected towards signal areas where there is more coverage needed. And similarly, we can make active devices which have much superior kind of um, performance. So without sacrificing the transparent antenna properties, we can have highly transparent antennas which can be embedded onto lens systems in order to uh, create high-speed data. So a final uh, application is, I guess a number of you have the skills now due to COVID having the, adjusting the mask and the uh, glasses at the right angle to, uh, to, to prevent the defogging. Uh, we have actually a process which is critical for next AR VR platforms to defog very effectively. And more importantly, we can actually have high conductivity which enables us to make a very high power up to 20 kilowatts per meter square um, rapid heating or applying of bias in order to make fast, ultra fast electrochromic switching. So with this, uh, I will conclude by uh, our slides, uh, which basically lists here the future AR fusion components, which will be integrated using the tools and the techniques that I have described here. I would like to welcome you to our next uh, talk at 2.15, which is presented by our CTO, Jonathan Waldron who will uh, further elaborate the techniques, uh, how to integrate these functional elements into prescription lenses. And I would like to welcome you to our expo um, booth at 219 as well. And thank you for all listening. Thank you for that. It's, uh, it's a lot of information in 20 minutes. It's like 10 pounds of sand in a five pound bag. And whoo. But for those of you who have uh, some pe uh, pressing questions, you see there's uh, other avenues today. But we have about three to four minutes. So, oh, please. Let me get down here so you can, uh, everyone can hear. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure most people recognize the problem you have with uh, the surface relief gratings on um, any kind of waveguide structures having rainbow effects. So standing in a room like this with an overhead light, a lot of rainbow. Do you get the same problem with your photopolymers? I guess I will let Andrew speak on Take that. that. Um, so volume on graphic gratings, uh, by their nature, by, because, well, by their nature, have much more controlled flare properties. Um, so essentially, you've got a downwards facing parabola on the Bragg curve, and as a result, you don't get diffraction conditions, or the diffraction condition is much harder to meet. Um, and that, that means that, yeah, as a result, you don't get very much in the way of flare. It does exist, but it's much easier to control. Can you comment on the durability of the lenses for something like safety glasses in an industrial setting? So at the moment, the, the lens technology is not sufficient to pass something like Z87.1. Uh, that's certainly something that we're working on. But at the moment, no, these would not be suitable as uh, replacement lenses for safety wear. Um. So I want to piggyback on the waveguide question. Again, as you know, with SRG waveguides, you have very low uh, brightness, right? You have less than 1% nits in to nits out. Yeah. Can you comment on an example of what your nits in to nits out might be? We, we tend to think in terms of diffraction efficiency for the free space combiners. In principle, we can make a holographic optical element that has 100% diffraction efficiency in all three channels. Now, you tend to not want to do that for aesthetic reasons, because it makes the hologram itself much more obvious. But in principle, a free space combiner can be 100% efficient, efficient in those three channels. 
Now, for a VHG-based in-coupler, out-coupler, there's no real difference in the sense that the, the losses in a, in a waveguide design come okay, partly from absorbance in the material itself. I think that's controllable and well understood. But really, the efficiency hit that you get with a waveguide design is because you're illuminating the entire eye. All the light is being divided over the entire outcoupler. So iBox replication, the price you pay for iBox replication is efficiency. That's not something that's unique to VHGs or SRGs. So with that, I want to say thanks to our presenters this morning for a fantastic job.